Uh, if you have a Bible, open up to Second Peter. This morning we're beginning a new series and a new book, two new books, excitingly enough. The last words of Peter and Paul. So Pastor John and I will be covering Second Peter and Second Timothy, uh, and we'll alternate between the two. But open up to Second Peter. Chapter 1, we're covering verses 1 through 4 this morning. The title of our message is The Power and Promises of God. So let's pray and we'll begin our study. Lord Jesus, we thank you for this opportunity to come and be fed, to worship you and to just center our attention on you, on who you are, Lord, on the truth that you've given us. We pray that your spirit would work and move this morning, that your spirit would speak to us through your word. And we thank you, Lord, for the things that your spirit reveals to us, the truth that has been revealed to us, the truth about your son, the truth about your grace, your mercies that are new every morning, your grace that sustains us. We thank you, Lord, that all of this is a gift from you. So we want to partake of that gift this morning. We want to receive what you are offering us, but help us, Lord God, to just drop everything else this morning. To let go of all that stuff. Lord, and to just to drink deeply of the well that you have provided. So we thank you again, Lord. We praise you. And we pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. And well, excited to start a new book with you guys. We're in Second Peter. Um, we're covering the last words of, of Peter and Paul. So Peter, if you couldn't tell by the title, wrote this letter. And he wrote it to encourage believers in holy living and warn them against false teachers that were creeping into the church at this time. It's written near the tail end of his life. We're not exactly sure when, but it's at a point where he knew that his life and his journey was coming to an end, that he would soon be with the Lord. He would be martyred killed for his faith. And so he warns, as his sort of last words, he warns against the danger of false teachers, as well as the destruction that follows returning to the world and its systems. And rather than turning to these things, he encourages them and admonishes them to grow in the knowledge of God, to remain in that place, to be fruitful in our knowledge of the Lord. So let's read the first four verses together. That's all we're going to cover this morning, just a a brief introduction to this letter, and we'll break it down verse by verse. But let's read it all together this morning. It says, Simeon, or Simon Peter, a servant and apostle of Jesus Christ. To those who have obtained a faith of equal standing with ours by the righteousness of our God and Savior, Jesus Christ, may grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. His divine power has granted to us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of him who called us to his own glory and excellence, by which he has granted to us his precious and very great promises, so that through them you may become partakers of the divine nature, having escaped from the corruption that is in the world because of sinful desire. And we'll pause right there. So, Simon Peter, Peter identifies himself as the writer and his intended audience to those who have attained this faith that he, 
and the other apostles possess, faith in Christ. And the way that he introduces himself is interesting. And if you guys were with us a couple of weeks ago as we studied very briefly the book of Jude, he, he introduces himself very similarly, describing himself as a servant or a bond servant, or maybe even more accurately, a slave. So Jude describes him as, himself as such, even though he's the half-brother of Jesus, chooses this humble title. Likewise, Peter, he's like one of Jesus' best friends during his earthly ministry, and yet des- decides to describe himself as a servant or a slave. And he chooses to use this word out of humility before describing himself as an apostle. Now that word apostle, it means sent one. But in Peter's case, it's also a very important title that describes the authority that he has been given by Jesus and the mission that he has received from the Lord. This is a position that God has given him. Paul writes about apostles in Ephesians chapter 2. And so Paul's writing about God's people who in Ephesians chapter 2 verse 20 are built on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets with Christ Jesus himself as the chief cornerstone. So this word apostle, it's not necessarily about, he's not using this word necessarily to draw attention to himself, but to remind his readers of the authority that he has received from the Lord. And that's important because Peter's going to be talking about false teachers, false teachers that are contradicting the apostles, contradicting the faith, trying to bring in new doctrines that are unbiblical and against the lived experiences of Paul uh, and Peter and and John and uh, among all the rest. So uh, uh, this, this title that he's using is just to remind people of this mission that he's been, he's, given, uh, he's been given from the Lord. So another thing to keep in mind is that this is among the last things that Peter is writing to anyone. We only have one other letter. It's 1 Peter, uh, which has been circulated amongst the churches in the Middle East and around the Mediterranean during this time, and he's writing this sort of follow-up sequel of a letter as a sort of conclusion to his ministry. He is aware of the fact that his time is sort of coming to an end. He says in Second Peter chapter one verses thirteen and fourteen, "I think it right, as long as I am in this body, to stir you up by way of reminder, since I know that the putting off of my body." will be soon, as our Lord Jesus Christ made clear to me. So he understands that his faith is going to cost him his life. And this is something that he's had years to kind of come to grips with. You guys might remember in John chapter 21, this is after Jesus' resurrection. Jesus sat with his disciples. They're having breakfast. This is the resurrected Christ. Jesus admonishes Peter to feed his sheep. And he says, this is Jesus speaking, he says, Truly, truly, I say to you, Peter, when you were young, you used to dress yourself and walk wherever you wanted. But when you're old, you will stretch out your hands and another will dress you and carry you where you do not want to go. Verse 19 This he said to show by what kind of death Peter was to glorify God. And after saying this, he said to him, follow me. And Peter kind of protests. He he looks at the apostle John. He says, what about that guy? And Jesus says, don't worry about that guy. Again, he implores him, follow me. In the face of knowing that the way that you're going to die is not through natural causes, is not through terminal illness or peacefully even in your sleep, but rather people are going to take him where he does not want to go, stretch him out. Now this might be a sort of illustration of the way that Peter was going to die more specifically if 
church tradition is correct that Peter was crucified and crucified upside down. So as the narrative goes, and we're not 100% sure, but as the narrative goes that Peter was uh, going to be crucified, and, and that makes sense because that was a common way to execute people during this time. But Peter protested at the idea, stating that he wasn't worthy of dying in the same manner as Jesus. And so he asked to be crucified head down. So they would have been crucified upside down. Now the evidence for this is uh, limited, but it, it does seem to be attested in some, a couple of early sources. Um, so if you see someone wearing a satanic cross, which is the cross upside down, you can go ahead and maybe use that as a ministry opportunity. Say, hey, do you know that's actually not satanic? That's how Peter possibly died, whatever. I don't know. It's it, the dumb things that people try to use and inappropriate, um, but really, uh, we can even use that. All that to say, Peter died. He, martyred, he was martyred, along with just about every other apostle except for uh, John. He died under... The Roman Emperor Nero, as did Paul, just a few years before Paul, probably around AD 64 or, or so. Again, evidence is limited as far as the crucifixion upside down, but coming to grips with the fact that his time was at an end. And so I think these words are all the more important when he understands his mortality. What is the last encouragement that he gives to believers. And we'll read about that in a, a, a second, but kind of to go back what Jesus says in the face of this reality of Peter's sort of fate, he implores him, follow me, follow me, feed my sheep and follow me. Luke 14, verse 27 and 28 Jesus says this, whoever does not bear his own cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. For which of you desiring to build a tower does not first sit down and count the cost, whether he has enough to complete it? In Matthew 16, verse 25, Jesus says this, for whoever wants to save their life will lose it, but whoever loses their life for me will find it. So the call to follow Jesus isn't necessarily about comfort or a peaceful death, even, unfortunately. I mean, we live, we live in, 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 in a very blessed circumstance to be in Western civilization where we're not persecuted unto death. Maybe some angry Facebook posts or some mockery and... And some, maybe someone will throw some rocks at you or whatever if you're, if you're trying to evangelize. But overall, we don't typically suffer this. But the reality is that more Christians are persecuted now, in the year of our Lord, 2024, now, than, now more than ever, believe it or not. Now it's easy to get sort of tunnel vision living in where we do in our circumstances, but, but persecution has not stopped, nor has the reality of counting the cost. Counting the cost. Realizing that with discipleship, there comes a dying to self, preferring the Lord's will over your own. No matter what that means, knowing that His ways and his will, and his plans are infinitely greater than ours. And so we would do well to prefer his will, to follow him. And it's as Peter said earlier in Jesus' ministry, when everyone was leaving and Jesus turns to the twelve and says, well, aren't you guys going to take off too? And Peter says, where else, where else are we going to go? You have the words of eternal life. And I hope that we all find ourselves in that same place. Yeah, there's options, but really there is no option other than to, other than to follow Jesus. And, and, and before we think that Peter is some kind of super saint, I mean Peter, 
lovable, gruff, silly Peter with all his ups and downs. I think it's sort of encouragement to see the, the, the work of God's grace and God's spirit in Peter's life. I don't want to get too sidetracked, but just, just I encourage you to read the Gospels, do, it, do a character study on Peter, this man who fled when Jesus' uh, uh, arrest came about. I mean, he got really worked up and cut off a guy's ear, but then he took off. He hid amongst the crowds. He denied Jesus three times. And yet that wasn't the end of Peter's story. Going from that place, hiding, running from his life, being scared of, of, of little girls, finding out that he was, you know, who he was, and from that place to boldly proclaiming the gospel, boldly living his life with some more ups and downs. But even so, with Christ as Lord, Empowered by the Spirit, Peter is just an awesome testimony, not of some super spiritual guy, but of a person who has been transformed by the Spirit of God, who has been transformed by the grace of God. We've got a lot to learn from Peter. And one of the first encouragements that he gives here is the way that he describes his audience. This isn't like... Um, Romans or Corinthians, where it was written to a specific church in mind, not that we can see. It seems to just be to believers in general. And he says, to those who obtained a faith of equal standing with ours by the righteousness of our God and Savior, Jesus Christ. This, this equal standing that he draws attention to he doesn't consider his own relationship with Christ to be super superior, even though he saw physically the ministry and the work and the, and the resurrected body of Jesus and was there on the Mount of Transfiguration and walked on the water and all the things that he could draw attention to, he doesn't. He says, we have equal standing. I find interesting. Peter, who saw the risen Christ, says that we can have the same faith as himself. Because our standing with the Lord, biblically speaking, is the same as Peter, James, and John. Because we don't stand on our own accomplishments. We don't stand on our own experiences. We stand in the righteousness of our God and Savior, Jesus Christ, as it says in verse 1. That word righteousness, I mean, we've, we've done a good in-depth study of righteousness through the book of Romans. Romans chapter 3, verse 22 says, We are made right, we are made righteous with God by placing our faith in Jesus Christ. And this is true for everyone who believes, no matter who we are. It's the New Living Translation, so it reads very, uh, it's got a good flow to it. But that's, that's the gist, that's the point. Pay attention in verse 1, the way that he describes Jesus. And, and we're going to kind of go through these verses slowly, paying attention to some of the language and some of the words that he's using. Here he refers to Jesus as God and Savior. Now, a lot of times you'll see in, in, in some of the New Testament epistles that refer to God the Father and then Jesus Christ. But here, uh, Jesus is referred to as both God and Savior. Those two descriptions are referring to the same subject. And, and, and the reason for that, not that there's any doubt as far as Jesus' divinity is concerned, but this letter is all about knowing the truth and combating the lies of false teachers, knowing God for who he is while condemning the heresy of the false doctrines that are going around. So, even as early as we, when this was written, probably around 60, 80, 60, somewhere around, around there, as early as that point in the church, there was challenges, and people coming up with 
lies and fables and ideas about who Jesus is. Oh, he wasn't really God. Or, oh, he was, wasn't really uh, the Messiah. Or, or he was this or he was that. And we'll get more into that in a bit. But just understand that Peter doesn't treat Jesus like a concept or a philosophy or just a moral teacher or an idea to be passed around. He's making it clear that Jesus is God in human flesh. Verse 2, may grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. Grace, grace is God's favor and generosity expressed towards those who do not deserve it. Now, this isn't just salvation grace, even though salvation is indeed a matter of grace, but so is everything else that the Lord has provided for us. It's grace, it's God's grace that sustains us, carries us, blesses us, grows us. All of these things, all of these things are gifts from God. We don't deserve them. We don't earn them. We don't uh, 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 develop enough, I don't know, spiritual brownie points to get on God's good side. It's all a matter of God's grace. So he says, grace multiplied to you and peace be multiplied to you. Peace with God, peace with each other is a common uh, Jewish sort of greeting, uh, 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 and even is to this day, the, uh, the, the concept and idea uh, of shalom. Peace with God and peace with each other. No strife, no divisiveness. Again, as we studied through the book of Romans, we understand that sin created enmity between us and the Lord. And so Christ died so that hostility between us and God would be removed, that the veil between us and God would be torn. Many live with the insecurity of not knowing where they stand with the Lord, not realizing that in Christ there's peace. There is peace between us and God. And so when I say peace, I'm not just talking about this emotional serenity, but peace in, as in the opposite of war. Peace is in the opposite of, of enmity. There's unity there, and that's between, uh, uh, unity between us and God as long as we are in Christ. So the peace of God and the grace of God have been given to us through Christ, established by his death. It says in John chapter 20, this is after the resurrection, and there's still some fear and tensions are high at this point. This is before the, the day of Pentecost, and people would be empowered by the Spirit. But it says in John 20 verse 19, on the evening of that day, the first day of the week, the doors being locked where the disciples uh, were for fear of the Jews. So they're hiding. Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. When he said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples were glad when they saw the Lord. Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. If the Father has sent me, even so I am sending you. And when he said this, he breathed on them and said to them, receive the Holy Spirit. So this peace and this grace, this is multiplied. The idea is just there's an abundance of it. And it says more specifically in verse 2, uh, grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. In the knowledge of God. Knowledge is an important word in, in 2 Peter. I encourage you, if you're doing your own study, that you would sort of underline it or highlight it whenever it pops up. Knowledge appears, that word, in the variant forms of it, appears seven times in 2 Peter, which is just a whopping three chapters, that's it. The only New Testament book that uses that word more is actually 1 Corinthians, uh, which I think is like 10 or 11 times. And 1 Corinthians, much longer than, than, first, than 2 Peter, rather. Uh, so it's just condensed and focuses a lot on this sort of 
key word. So knowing God, the knowledge of God, being fruitful in our knowledge of the Lord is a key theme in 2 Peter, knowing God for who he truly is and not what we think that he is or what we feel that we is, that he, that he is, rather. So there's two words for knowledge uh, used in this book. There's gnosis, which is like informational knowledge, and, and epinosis, which is precise and correct knowledge. So not just knowing about something, but knowing something completely, fully with discernment and with experiences to back it up. Do we know God? Do we know God, and are we growing in that knowledge? Do we, do we know God deeply and relationally? Or do we just know about God, or know of Him, or know secondhand through what our spouse says about Him, or through what the pastor says about Him, or, or what we've heard on the radio, uh, for those of you that still listen to radio, uh, no disrespect. I'm a YouTube guy myself, podcast. But that direct, experiential, full knowledge of God, that doesn't mean that we know everything about him, because good luck with that. He's beyond, he's beyond even our comprehension. And yet, even so, the revealed things belong to us, as it says in Deuteronomy 29. And he's revealed himself to us through his Son. And so we can know God. And we can know him in a deep and loving way, in the same way that hopefully for you married folk, as you know your spouse more, you're able to love them more, more effectively, efficiently. The honeymoon phase is over. And the delusion of who you thought that they were, gone. But in replace of that is something better more rich and fulfilling because it's not a delusion anymore. It's not, a, it's not just the, 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 the emotions and the hormones when you first meet someone, you've got a crush or whatever it is, but it's now based on an experiential reality that's growing and is hopefully more fruitful uh, day in and day out. Do we know God? And if there's an absence of, of peace in our lives, I mean, really, and, and rather than turning to all of the, 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 the dumb solutions that we concoct through philosophy and everything else, and people will try anything and everything before just knowing God. They have no peace, and so they want to know themselves, they want to know this, they want to get into hobbies and, and, and careers and whatever else, rather than just knowing God, who has made himself available to us through his Son. Do we know God? Pay attention, if we could just nerd out for a moment, in the first two verses with the descriptions of Jesus that we see. There's four of them. Do you see them? Jesus is described in four different ways by Peter. He refers to him as God, Savior, Lord, and Christ, or Messiah, which would be the, the Hebrew uh, variant of that word Christ. So Peter brings these four descriptions of Jesus into the spotlight, and I, I'm digging it, because we shouldn't separate those different things. They're all together in unity. That's who he is. So we can't have Jesus as Savior without having him also as God. Does that make sense? We, we can't say, oh, he's, he's Messiah, but Lord, that's a bit much. We can't say, oh, well, Jesus is a great moral teacher. He's a great philosopher. He taught about love and peace and puppy dogs and rainbows. And I mean, he taught about sin and hell. He taught about salvation and God. If you've seen me, you've seen the Father. Before Abraham was, I am, he says. He's God. And I think that's very relevant 
in Peter's day as it is in ours, as people take the idea of Jesus and turn him into an idea and try to form him into their own image. And, oh, look at that. He supports this and he supports that. How convenient. As I focus on the parts I want to focus on and ignore the parts of him that I don't want to focus on and make some stuff up that aren't actually true and suddenly you don't have Jesus anymore just because he's got the picture of him, his long hair and his, and his beard and his robe with the red sash. and It's a caricature. And even as Christians, sometimes we fall into delusions of what we think God is like, but thankfully we don't have to guess. We don't have to make stuff up. We don't have to resort to nonsense philosophies. God has made himself known. God has made himself known, and he is all these things. God, Savior, Lord, Messiah, all in unity because he's not a concept, he's not a philosophy, he is a person. The Trinity is three persons, one God. We can't have one part without the other. We can't make God in our own image. God has made us in his image to know him, to know him for each, who he truly is. And, and, and I'm sorry if I'm, I'm belaboring the point, but that's, that's, that's Peter's whole thing, and I love the way that he's starting off this letter because it's about knowing the truth. And the more you know the truth, the more, you'll be, the, the more effectively you'll be able to spot the lies, the nonsense, the noise, and the, 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 the bad, false doctrines. As we said just a few weeks ago in our study of Jude, that the best way to know a counterfeit is to study the real thing, to be familiar with it. And so, yes, there's a very strong emphasis in 2 Peter when it comes to knowledge and knowing. Well, let's look at verses 3 and 4 again, and it says, His divine power has granted to us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of Him who called us to His own glory and excellence, by which he has granted to us his precious and very great promises, so that through them you may become partakers of the divine nature, having escaped from the corruption that is in the world because of sinful desire. That's, a, that's an action-packed couple of verses right there, but let's, let's sort of take it uh, piece by piece. We see the power of God, the power of Christ, this divine power as he describes it here. It's, so Christ not only saves us from our sins, but he also gives us what we need, empowers us to live holy lives. So salvation isn't just a matter of receiving a ticket to heaven. But this lifelong, eternity-long process of becoming more and more like God. More who Christ has called us to be. This word godliness that he uses in verse 3. So this power has given us all things that pertain to life and godliness. That word godliness is Eusebia. It's the same word used in Acts chapter 3. So in Acts chapter 3, Peter uh, 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 heals a lame beggar who was begging outside of the temple courts. And he, he says, you know, he tells him to get up and walk. And everyone's amazed. And in chapter 3, verse 12 of Acts, it says, When Peter saw this, he addressed the people, fellow Israelites, why are you amazed at this? Why do you stare at us as though we had made him walk by our own power, dunamis, or godliness, Eusebia? So if, if this early on in the church's ministry, make no mistake, it's only ever been by the power 
that God has provided, and the godliness that he is working out in and through us, not of our own piety or our own self-efforts, but rather the ministry that we develop in our hearts, partnering with God as he works in and through us, day in, day out, this transformative process and this sanctification. My, my, my point is this, is that when, when, when believers become discouraged, thinking that they're left to their own devices, God's word says otherwise. He's, behold, I, behold, I am with you even to the end of the age. The same mission that God has given us, he also gives us the, the equipping to obey, the empowering to yield to the power of his spirit, the, the empowering to obey him and to walk in step with his spirit. One Bible commentator wrote this about, about the, 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 the verse, chapter, uh, uh, chapter 1, verse 3. So R.C. Lucas says this, This is a slight under-translation because has given renders doreomai, which can mean a generous imperial gift or even volunteering for service. It underlines the graciousness and generosity of the giver. Jesus Christ has generously given all that could ever be required to be godly. So we don't attain anything that hasn't already been provided for us in Jesus. I mean, of course, we mature and we grow, but we mature in the Christ. We mature in Christ in whom we already know. We grow by the power of the Spirit whom we've already received. We grow in the knowledge of the one who has already made a covenant with us, sealed by his Spirit and established, not by our righteousness, but by his righteousness, established by his blood. We don't need to supplement the work of Christ. We just need to nurture what he has already given us to yield to it, to submit to it with a willing heart. So he's given us everything that we need pertaining to life and godliness through the knowledge, there's that word again, of him who called us to his own glory and excellence by which he has granted to us precious and very great promises So if you were to read ahead, and I encourage you to do so, this is actually, I don't know how to describe this. From what, I've, from what I understand, this whole section is kind of like one long sentence in the Greek. So verse 1 all the way through like verse 11 kind of just keeps going and going and going and doesn't stop. So I encourage you to read the whole thing when you get a chance. But verses 5 through 11 kind of focuses on the product, productivity of our faith, the, 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 the way that the, the sort of the form that the obedience kind of takes and what it looks like in our lives. But before he gets to verses 5 through 11, where does he start with? He starts with God. He starts with the Lord. It begins with God. It begins with Christ, with his power, and with his promises. So he, he focuses first on the power and then the promises. So we cannot before we, we get into obedient living, holy living, Christ-honoring obedience, before we get to that, we need to start in this place of his power and his promises in the work that he has done. And we get to walk in that. And, that, and, and, and that's a, a, a joy and a relief, knowing that I don't need to muster up super holiness, which I do not possess. 
apart from Christ. But I get to rest in him. And that doesn't involve a yoke and a burden, but it is light. And it is easy. I'm walking in the works that Christ has prepared beforehand. We, we're called to this. We're called to this glory and excellence by which he has given us these promises. Now, Peter isn't specific about these promises. What promises? It could be the promise of, 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 of his Holy Spirit, the promise of his power, the promise of Christ's return. I think all of these are valid, uh, but more specifically, as it pertains to this section, uh, the promises seem to be connected with what's said next, uh, granted to us his precious and very great promises, so that through them you might become partakers, partakers of divine nature, of the divine nature. Promise that we will, put, these promises are of, uh, of, uh, in reference to that partaking of divine nature. Now, this is a unique phrase in the New Testament. It's, it's unique to 2 Peter. I mean, 2 Peter is unique in a lot of ways, and maybe we'll talk about that as we go through it. Um, so Peter's subject matter is very Jewish, but some of the language that he uses is very Greek. That might have to do with the scribe that, that penned this. So Peter's speaking it out loud, and someone's writing it down. It might have to do with the way that that person decided to to, to write that based on the culture and, and what's going on. but So the reason why I bring that up is because we don't really see this word, partakers of divine nature. Or we don't see this phrasing anywhere else, but it is a significant and it is biblical, obviously, because that is what we enjoy in God, is becoming more and more like Him. We're called to be sons of the Most High. And, and even as we look back throughout the Old Testament, this is something that God has always called his creation to. So I had the, 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 the blessing of being at the marriage conference uh, yesterday in, in C.C. Tracy. And one of the sessions that, that uh, um, piqued my interest was that of the purpose of marriage. And when you want to talk about the purpose of marriage, it's important to understand what the purpose isn't in when it comes to marriage. And, and, and uh, one of the speakers, I think it was Pastor John, um, Pastor Paul, rather, he touched on the inherent worth that we possess just as God's creation, just as being mankind created in his image. It says in Genesis chapter 1, verse 26, let us make man in our own image, in our image, after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over the livestock and over, the, over the, all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So I'm, I'm totally going to butcher his point, but just give me a moment. It was something to the effect of marriage isn't intended for us to, to find our value and our purpose and our worth. We already have that. Adam and Eve already had that just by being created by the Lord with that in mind before they were ever together and married. And likewise, I mean, that was his admonishment to us rather than trying to find value and worth in each other, using each other for something that we weren't created for, trying to get from our spouse something that we can only receive from the Lord and have already received, we have already received value and worth. Problems arise when we try to find value, worth, and validation in things other than God. We cannot look to creation to give us what only God can give. To tie that back to the text, we get to be partakers in divine nature, to be who God created us to be. We were created in his image, but that image has been broken and marred by sin. And yet Christ comes in and makes us whole. Christ comes in and transforms us 
to better reflect who he is. It says in Colossians chapter 3, verse 9 and 10, Do not lie to one another since you have put off the old self with its practices and have put on the new self. You are being renewed in the knowledge according to the image of your creator. And Peter ties this to the promise of God. The promises of God. It's not suggested. It's not... It's not uh, uh, um, Recommended, it's promised. And it's one of those things as we study these promises and prophecies, it's one of those things where it's already but not yet. As in, we see the partial fulfillment and we await the totality of it. Because we still struggle with sin. I don't, I don't, I don't, I'm not buying the theology that we can attain sinless perfection in this life. Point me to that person that has attained that. I would love to meet them. And, I, I, I. and even if they can fool everyone around them, you can't fool the Lord. He sees our hearts. He knows us. He knows our struggles. We don't have to hide. We shouldn't hide them from him. We get to come to him with our struggles in times of need and receive help and mercy. And, and so the way that he kind of applies this, the way Peter applies this, so, so that we may, that through the, the, the promises, we may, may become partakers of the divine nature. Does that word become is sort of a future tense? Having escaped from the corruption that is in the world because of sinful desire. So this promise is actively being fulfilled. He who began a good work in you will be faithful to complete it until the day of Christ Jesus. Already, but not yet. The good news is that the true promises of God, who we are in him, what he has promised us, what he has given us and is going to give us, all that can encourage us and be utilized by the believer to combat the false promises of sin, of sinful desire, and, 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 and of the flesh, by which we escape corruption. The true promises of God and combat the false promises of sinful desire, which promises a whole lot. Oh, you should do this. You should. You no. It's not going to bother anyone. Or like, oh, you know, God doesn't understand and what you're going through. So you need to turn to this or turn to that. All the lies of the enemy that he gives us when it comes to sin. And in this life, as we wrestle with this reality. I think we should turn to these promises which speak both of the present and the future because we get to actively see them at work in our lives. We get to see the work of God transforming us. You know, do you struggle with something? Have you given that to the Lord? And as you, as you give it to Him, are you watching Him work and move in ways that you would, you would never be able to accomplish or replicate on your own? Praise the Lord. If, you, if you're not seeing that, know that he has made himself available to you through his son. Turn to him. Don't rely on the false promises that the world has to offer. When God has already given us so much, everything that we need pertaining to life and godliness. I was, I, I was, I was talking to my wife, if I could just be completely transparent with you guys for a few minutes. Because uh, uh, I don't like to talk about myself too much when I'm standing here. I mean, if you want to have a one-on-one -on -one conversation, you know, let's open up the books, whatever. Um, 
with wisdom. But I say this to encourage you guys. As, as I was talking to my wife, I'm like, man, I'm struggling with this, and I feel discouraged by that, and I feel burdened by that. And this is a few weeks ago. There's some stuff going on. And, and she lovingly reminded me that the, that, that struggle isn't nearly as big as it used to be. That, that the grace of God has been more clear. The power of God has been more vivid year in, year out. And, and, and when you're in it, you, you can sort of get this limited scope where you kind of just focus on the winds and the waves and the circumstances around you. But kind of just pause and back up for a second and look at the trajectory that Christ has brought you through on all that Christ has done in the past and the faithfulness that he has shown you over the years. And he's going to continue to do that work. There's going to be ups. There's going to be downs. But as we began our study, our faith does not stand on our performance. That's going to be exhausting. That's going to be discouraging. Our faith stands in the righteousness of Christ. And His alone, not mine. So when I mess up, I can repent all the more quicker. I can get up all the more faster. I can get back to running the race. Moving forward, hand to plow. I'm going to conclude with three points, just really simple, and you've already read them in the text, but I think that just to give you something to chew on. Because this, this isn't so much like, you know, oh, you know, what do we... It, it, this, this study is more about what Christ has done for us and what God has done for us. And, and, and to work from that place, rather than trying to work towards his favor, we have already received it. We've received everything we need, and so... Our three points are this. He has given us grace and peace. Secondly, he has given us power and promises. Thirdly, he has given us everything we need for life and godliness. So we have, and with that in mind, we have no excuse. To be lazy or to, to make excuses or to throw the pity party. I'm no stranger to the pity party. It's my favorite kind of party is to... But it's a, it's a rut that we can get stuck in when, when God has called us to glory and excellence. He's called us to holy living. And, 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 and by God's grace, he doesn't just call us there, he leads us there. He, he feeds us, sustains us. And all the world, all the world is dying of spiritual thirst. Jesus stands up amongst the crowd. He offers us living water. My encouragement to you is to just continue to grow in that knowledge. Always be a student. Remember these promises. Familiarize yourself with the real deal. He has been faithful in the past. He's faithful now. He's going to continue to be faithful. That doesn't always mean comfort. That doesn't always mean being happy, go lucky, whatever, sunshine and rainbows. But the, the call of discipleship, and there is a cost involved, but the greatest price, the price that we could not pay, could never pay, has been paid by the Lord Jesus, by his blood. And we get to, we get to walk in that finished work. Amen? Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we thank you. We thank you, Lord God.
for your finished work. We thank you, Lord God, for the promises that you've given us and all that we have received. Forgive us for being so, for any cynicism or doubt. You've blessed us with so much. So fill our hearts with gratitude. And Holy Spirit, fill us to overflowing. Empower us to walk in the truth that you've given us, Lord. We thank you for these things, Lord. We praise you in Jesus' name. Amen.